Hello, my name is Susan Park. I'm Professor of Global Governance at the University of Sydney and welcome to my podcast. I'm going to be speaking today about protecting environmental rights through international grievance mechanisms. International grievance mechanisms have proliferated uh, with the attendant rise of globalisation, creating new avenues of recourse for people environmentally and socially harmed um, at multiple scales. International grievance mechanisms are increasingly common means to attempt to rectify harm as a means of um, that result from international intervention in developing countries by states, by corporations and by international organisations. So what I aim to do in this podcast is to make three points. First, to analyse the different standards that international grievance mechanisms use to provide justice, most notably the United Nations Guiding Principles and the Environmental and Social Protection Standards promulgated first by the World Bank. I identify within these standards three procedural environmental rights, um, which include access to information, access to participation, and access to justice in environment, environmental matters, as well as referencing specific environmental protections. Second, I then investigate the activities of different types of international grievance mechanisms. I look specifically in my research at the independent accountability mechanisms of the multilateral development banks to try and identify whether or not these can be used to protect procedural environmental rights and the rights of nature. And what I've done in my research is to um, undertake a content analysis of 394 publicly available original grievance claims that have been submitted to the independent accountability mechanisms of the multilateral development banks up to the end of 2018. So people adversely affected by a project financed by the World Bank, for example, can go to its inspection panel to have their, um, to provide uh, recourse for those environmental and social harms. And what claimants seek recourse for is generally failures to uphold their procedural environmental rights, their lack of access to information about development projects that affect them, the lack of participation in, um, in helping to design or at least know of um, and respond to those development projects that affect them. And they also seek recourse for the rights of nature, independent of their reliance on it. So identifying biodiversity loss, not just in relation to livelihoods through fishing, for example. The third aim is to investigate how um, access to justice in environmental matters is provided through these independent accountability mechanisms. And the vast majority of them now have um, dual functions, problem solving, which is a form of alternative dispute resolution and compliance investigations that identify whether or not the harm resulted for the acts or omissions of the multilateral development bank. So the World Bank has just one, it's a compliance investigation function, but the other multilateral development banks like the Asian Development Bank, um, like the Inter-American Development Bank have dual functions, the problem solving that directly liaises with communities versus the compliance investigation to determine fault and whether or not um, the, the bank has not followed its policies, environmental and social policies leading to harm. So I use a database of over a thousand claims um, that have been submitted to the independent accountability mechanisms over the course of their existence. I detail how they provide recourse for environmental and social harm within the context of international development financing. So what grievance, what rights? Well, international grievance mechanisms are recognisably one avenue for recourse and remedy for people adversely affected by the activities of transnational and international actors. Um, the other means are through national legal or political means or, for, um, or through international legal, um, legal avenues. And there are strong reasons why people may choose international procedures or recourse, not least because they may be putting themselves in great harm by speaking out to protect themselves and their environment. And there are only two, um, indeed the Eskisu Agreement, a regional agreement includes protections for environmental defenders. And this is important considering the rise globally of, um, of uh, attacks against environmental defenders and including, you know, including killing them. The local actors can choose to work with international NGOs to instigate the boomerang process to request international actors 
in order to force domestic change. International attention also provides some protection against state reprisal. Other considerations may also play a deciding role, including the extent to which the transnational or international actor is the primary producer, investor or financier of the activity contributing to harm and therefore the best means of stopping it. The capacity of the state to address complainants' concerns may also shape the decision to choose international fora. So legal and non-legal means are open to people adversely affected by the activities of transnational and international actors. Legal processes like international courts and tribunals have increased in number, and these can adjudicate, adjudicate disputes over natural resources, such as the International Court of Justice, and increasingly deal with environmental and human health risks, as does the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. So these are legal um, state-based processes which may or may not be linked to the needs and desires of those directly harmed. Indeed, states are often complicit with transnational and international actors in economic activities, including the extraction of natural resources and in financing large-scale infrastructure projects that contribute to harm. As a result uh, of past imperial resource extraction, developing states have used international law as a means to protect their sovereign right to exploit, uh, exploit their resources. This permanent right over natural resources rests with the nation, not with individuals or local communities. And obligations attendant to this right have also increased over time to include environmental conservation or to respect the rights and interests of indigenous peoples and a duty to use natural wealth and resources in a sustainable way. So the second form of recourse is a non-judicial process using these international grievance mechanisms. And I define international grievance mechanisms as an international mechanism created by transnational or international actors that give affected or potentially affected people the right to seek recourse for the impacts of their activities, especially where they have no access to a liability mechanism. So these international grievance mechanisms seek to provide direct recourse for people and their environments adversely affected by the actions of transnational and international actors. And I examine how non-judicial processes can work to ameliorate environmental and social harm when claims are instigated by people on behalf of their communities and ecosystems. These are very much people-driven mechanisms. They have to come from those seeking recourse. This is especially important as international grievance mechanisms can identify that they can only play a role if judicial recourse cannot or has not been instigated. So for example, the Inter-American Inter Development Bank's grievance mechanism um, will not accept claims if there is a legal dispute going on about the project. And that legal dispute may have absolutely nothing to do with the harm inflicted um, on people in the area as a result of the project. So we can look to um, specific international declarations and um, standards, environmental standards that have emerged over time, which have uh, implicit or explicit procedural environmental rights embedded within them. Um, if we look to the types of um, standards that international grievance mechanisms uphold, we can find those um, in these international documents that have emerged over time, specific declarations. So the idea that individuals and communities have rights to their environment appeared first in the 1972 Stockholm Declaration, uh, Principle 1, reinforced in the 1992 uh, Rio Declaration, Principle 10, um, it's evident in Agenda 21 and the 1987 World Commission on Environment and Development Report, the Brundtland Report. At Rio, it was specifically formulated the link between human rights and environmental protection in procedural terms, including participation, access to information, and access to redress and remedy. And procedural rights are now beginning to be incorporated into international environmental agreements. However, these procedural environmental rights are rarely codified on their own in, in international environmental law. Few exceptions to this include the UN uh, regional conventions, the 1998 Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making, and Access uh, to Justice in Environmental Matters. This is housed under the UN Economic Commission for Europe and is otherwise known as their Aarhus Convention. The second one is the 
2018 ESCASU Agreement, which is a binding regional treaty for Latin America by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And thus far, um, it has, I believe, only been ratified by two states. So instead of legal means of recourse, we have a neoliberal non-regulatory approach that has dominated international approaches to the activities of multinational corporations. Failure to gain agreement on regulating MNCs led to the UN Global Compact, the failure of UN norms on trans transnational and business activity, and the promotion of the guiding principles for business and human rights in relation to human rights and transnational corporations and other enterprises, which was established by UN Spe Special Representative of the Secretary General, John Ruggie. These voluntary standards that corporations should adhere to are compared with standards set by the World Bank that have been emulated by other public and private funders. These are um, what are known as environmental safeguard policies. So the three guiding UN guiding principles are to protect, to respect, and to remedy human rights abuses. There's little reference in the guiding principles as to how business impacts on the environment, although procedural environmental rights are evident. In order to enact human rights principles, business enterprises must be expected to do the following. They must have a human rights policy that is publicly available, access to information. They must undertake due diligence, or that, sorry, they should undertake due diligence, including risk assessments and environmental and social impact assessments, and where appropriate, engage in meaningful consultation with potentially affected groups and other stakeholders, access to participation. Finally, they must have legitimate processes of remediation to address harm through, for example, an operational level grievance mechanism, access to justice in environmental matters. The guiding principles do not reference free prior and informed consent, stating that business enterprises should engage in consultation rather than gain consent from affected stakeholders. In comparison, Procedural, procedural environmental rights have emerged within the World Bank and other development lenders over time. Access to information is provided for in the form of information disclosure policies. Access to participation is referenced in terms of meaningful consultation in environmental assessment policies, as well as specific policies on poverty reduction, gender dimensions of development, involuntary resettlement and Indigenous peoples. It was also later incorporated into the free prior and informed consultation. Access to justice in environmental matters is evident in the creation of these independent accountability mechanisms from 1994 onwards. The very first was the World Bank's inspection panel. So people, scholars like Mares argue that there should be further cross-fertilization among the guiding principles, the World Bank and other development finance standards to protect human rights. Although it is clear that this is already occurring. The World Bank has flagged its objective to respect re um, human rights, including the adoption of free prior and informed consultation in its um, environmental and social framework devised in 2016 and coming into effect in 2018. Previously, it had required borrowers to engage in a process of free, prior and informed consultation. The World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, the Equator Principles and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People now all align on FPIC, while the guiding principles more generally defer to performance standards um, required by institutions that support overseas investments, such as those outlined by the World Bank um, and these use a due diligence approach that accords with environmental and social risk management used by development financiers. So both the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation now also include labour standards. So there are across all of the different standards um, these procedural environmental rights. So what right of recourse is there? Well, there's two takeaways from looking at the spread of international grievance mechanisms. The, the first takeaway, and this is a picture here of an investigation team from the World Bank Inspection Panel out investing, investigating claims of environmental and social harm as a result of World Bank Finance Project. One of the first takeaways is that non-judicial me um, mechanisms do not offer a remedy. They specifically focus on the provision of recourse 
that may lead to redress. So this is to identify the fault or the harm or to provide uh, people with a means of, um, of, of airing their grievance, not necessarily that it's going to be fixed. So this is glaring in terms of the outcomes that people harmed by international event interventions can get from engaging in this form of recourse. And this is something that clearly has to be examined um, and thought through when, uh, when claimants choose to go down this route to seek redress. Second, what are the outcomes of these international grievance mechanisms? Well, there's a range of different international grievance mechanisms that exist, as you can see on the screen. There's multi-stakeholder forums, such as the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. There are industry-based grievance mechanisms, such as the Fair Trade Association. Um, the MDBs, multilateral development banks, all have these independent accountability mechanisms. And, and I'm gonna walk through some of the results there. And then at the corporate level, there are project level international grievance mechanisms. Well, a study by um, Zegelmeyer recently uh, for the UN identified that the operations of existing mechanisms can be ascertained by their structure, by their coverage, by their procedures, outcomes and effectiveness in relation to the guiding principles criteria. Many of the international guiding, uh, international grievance mechanisms focus on human rights and conditions of work compared with environmental matters. While there is a variety of um, structures and coverage, there was uncertainty over what international grievance mechanisms procedures existed and no evidence of how decisions for remedy were made, implemented and enforced, or how management incorporate feedback and learning. So the review highlights the dearth of publicly available um, information on international grievance mechanisms established by corporations with limited and primarily case study research conducted primarily by um, non-government organisations. So the results of the report point to a glaring lacuna on the procedural or the substantive practices of corporations in using international grievance mechanisms alone, either or as part as multi-stakeholder processes. In terms of what they tend to recognise, international grievance mechanisms tend to hew either to the UN guiding principles, the World Bank protection standards, or um, sector-specific international framework agreements for non-judicial redress and access to justice internationally. So the guiding principles in the World Bank standards are moving closer together, as I've um, argued before, creating a dense web of human rights and environmental standards. Criteria for how the international grievance mechanisms should operate has also been established, with the guiding principle efforts and those of the independent accountability mechanisms of the multilateral development banks emerging in parallel, with some overlaps as to what constitutes justice. I want to give you just some idea as to what some of the outcomes are um, because the independent accountability mechanisms of the multilateral development banks emerged from, the, from 1994 onwards. We've been able to track um, the claims that have come to the grievance mechanisms over a 20 year period um, through a database and I'll give the link at the end um, that I've comprised of all the publicly um, available information, but I've also uh, looked at all of the publicly available claims, the original submissions to these grievance mechanisms over a 20 year period. So this is to give you an idea as to what form of access to justice and environmental matters can look like. Um, so we can identify um, that there have been over a thousand claims to the multilateral development banks. And, and if you look at the graph, uh, we're talking about the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank Group. Um, and so we can look at what some of the results are because we can track how these claims have played out. So um, claimants, um, Coming to, uh, coming to the banks looking for problem solving, that is a direct ability to have their grievance addressed um, by the bank and the executing agency, whether or not it's a government department or whether or not it's a multinational corporation or a local company. And we can look at the fact that of all of the claims that come to these mechanisms, 18.2% of registered claims will actually lead to a successful agreement between the parties. So this um, is a very, very low number, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that 
uh, that these processes don't work. So essentially this means that Avas, uh, about 50% of the claims are rejected or nearly 50% of the claims are rejected because they do not um, meet the criteria for being uh, for going to problem solving, which means that um, the criteria is very uh, very narrow. It has to be an environmental and social problem. It has to be financed by the bank, um, and it has to be not related to fraud or corruption. Um, so, so these are the types of of um, uh, claims that will be considered bona fide. Um, once they are accepted. Um, they then are assessed in terms of whether or not all of the parties agree to a process of, of problem solving or, or negotiation. And a vast majority of claims um, do not go to mediation or do not lead to a successful agreement precisely because there is an unwillingness of the parties to commit mediation. And the reason is, is that quite often by the time claims get to uh, get to a um, this stage, there is a high degree of toxicity um, in the relationship between the company, um, between the bank and between the community. And of course, when it comes to um, loss of livelihoods, when it comes to um, environmental and social degradation, um, this is not surprising. So mediation um, leads to a relatively small number of an agreement between the parties as to how to rectify the problem and the basis of which is, of course, that these projects will go ahead regardless. So there are a lot of options on the, uh, that are excluded from being discussed um, at the problem solving uh, with communities. Whether or not we can identify whether or not there are unjust practices that take place, um, there certainly have been occurrences um, uh, particularly at the beginning uh, in the 1990s when these mechanisms were first established and there were ways of rejecting um, rejecting valid claims um, as either not meeting um, very technical criteria. Um, the Asian Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank um, demonstrated these unjust practices where management worked on addressing uh, said that they were addressing the problem, even though they had, in, in many cases, a long time to address the problem, and that was considered a valid reason for the um, independent accountability mechanism not to undertake an investigation, despite the fact that the accountability mechanisms are considered to be last resorts. And um, some of the independent accountability mechanisms, like the Inter-American Development Banks, have it, this judicial exclusion. That is, they will not consider um, a claim if there is uh, a legal dispute going on within the project, even if it has nothing to do with the grievance. If we look at the compliance investigations, um, which is where claims come to the independent accountability mechanisms of the, uh, of the multilateral development banks, a lot more go to investigation. So this, um, this function is to identify who was at fault, who contributed to the harm. Was it as a result of the acts or omissions of the multilateral development bank in not meeting those environmental and social policies, in not meeting um, access to information, in not leading to access to participation? And it demonstrates that 39% um, of all claims over this period up to the end of 2018 were investigated. And a quarter of all of those claims going to compliance were found non-compliant with environmental and social policies. Um, so this demonstrates that um, the independent accountability mechanisms can be used to identify when the banks have not, um, not met those um, environmental criteria and have contributed to harm. Um, there is some evidence of unjust practices, but generally the mechanisms work in being able to identify when the banks um, have uh, contributed to harm. So um, one bank in particular, an Inter-American Development Bank, um, is recognised for having interference by its board in seeking to stop compliance investigations from taking place. And this is um, particularly because the multilateral development banks fear reputation loss in knowing that um, projects that they are financing are actually contributing to harm. And so um, many of the banks don't want compliance investigations to go ahead, um, but you can certainly see board interference in, in one of those banks' cases. So generally speaking, um, the independent accountability mechanisms demonstrate that um, a form of recourse is available at the international level. 
um, that this meets a procedural environmental right. Um, small number of claims do come to the mechanisms in order to protect the environment independent of claimants' um, reliance on, on the environment. Um, so there is a mixed trend here as to how useful it is uh, for, for project affected people or people harmed by um, projects funded by the multilateral development banks. And we, we need to bear this in mind when we seek to continue or recreate or advance international grievance mechanisms at the international level for project affected people. So thanks for listening. Um, look forward to any sort of comments that come through, but uh, I would also at this point just identify that here is the link to the database where you can look up all of the grievance mechanism claims that have come to the multilateral development banks from 1994 through to uh, an updated 2019 version. Thanks for listening. Bye.